No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. This is the first season of Netflix's The Punisher, and it was 100% unnecessary. The Punisher had already received a near-perfect introduction in the Marvel Netflix timeline in Daredevil Season 2. By the time that season ended, we left with a very full and complete understanding of who the Punisher is and what drives him to do the things he does. You, big, you call me the Punisher, right? That right? The big bad Punisher. When you also consider that this is a character with no shortage of completely excellent source material to drive multiple seasons, it raises questions as to why that was all abandoned in favor of an origin story that feels like it spends half the time dragging its feet in a past that we already understand. Before we get into this, be sure to like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic if you haven't done so already. The Punisher was a standalone series produced by Netflix, and it was based on the titular anti-hero from Marvel Comics created by Jerry Conway, John Romita Sr., and Ross Andrew. Frank Castle, aka The Punisher, is a father and husband who turns into an extremely violent vigilante after his family is murdered. He hunts criminals and is often associated with the takedowns of large criminal organizations. He's sort of like what would happen if Dexter and Rambo had a really angry baby. As mentioned, The Punisher was introduced to us in season two of the Marvel Netflix show Daredevil, and it was quite the introduction. <laughs> Not only did Netflix cast a fan favorite choice to helm the role of Frank Castle with the selection of John Bernthal, they delivered on the character with an adaptation that felt like it hit the bullseye in terms of being faithful to the source material. As far as The Punisher goes, this is something that had yet to be done in film and or television. 1989's The Punisher is a little too campy. How long do you think someone can live after you've cut out their heart? A long... 2004's The Punisher felt a little too much like an espionage film. Go with God. God's gonna sit this one out. And 2008's The Punisher Warzone made some really silly choices in regards to villains. I'm gonna get my applesauce back. So fans were both ready and hopeful that after the success of his appearance in Daredevil, Netflix would be able to convert The Punisher into another successful Marvel series. The first season of The Punisher isn't bad, by any means. It just feels like it spends a lot of time taking huge steps backwards instead of moving an already established character forward. In the second season of Daredevil, we are treated to a near-perfect introduction to a character that has had nothing but trouble in regard to a live-action adaptation. One of the things that makes The Punisher's introduction feel so perfect in this timeline is that he's introduced in the same way he was introduced in the comics, as a villain. Setting the Punisher up in Daredevil was a perfect idea. Not only does Frank Castle fit seamlessly into the dark and gritty tone that Netflix developed for the series, but Frank Castle and Matt Murdock are not that far removed from one another. The Punisher is almost like a distorted reflection of who Daredevil could potentially be if he made a mistake. This juxtaposition of these two vigilantes gives us, as a viewer, a firm understanding of the philosophical differences between them and piques our interest in terms of our perceptions of justice. That's really what makes The Punisher interesting. He's a sympathetic character who anyone can resonate with, despite being a totalitarian vigilante who sees the world in black and white. We receive a lot of this character development throughout the excellent dialogue between Frank Castle and Matt Murdock throughout Daredevil's second season. Why am I here? Everything you do out there in the streets, Red, it doesn't work. Did you know that? Oh, and what you're doing is better? What I do, I just do. It's out of necessity. Some of the more interesting scenes in the entire Marvel TV canon happen when the two of them are on screen together. In Frank Castle, we see a man who lost everything and was driven to the brink of insanity, coping with trauma in an extremely violent and dangerous way. It's these discussions about the concept of morality that really drive the narrative and enthrall us into the inner workings of his mind. It really shouldn't have come as a surprise when Netflix announced that The Punisher was receiving a standalone series. Fans were absolutely elated over his appearance as the supporting character in Daredevil. However, this first season of Punisher feels like it spends a lot of time telling us and showing us things that we already know, and in the process, ends up spinning its wheels instead of pushing the character forward in ways that we want him to be pushed. This is largely due to the film industry's rampant obsession with telling origin stories. Going into the first season of The Punisher, we already know why and how Frank Castle became to be. All of that exposition was delivered to us in Daredevil, but for some reason, the decision was made to retread all of that ground to deliver on something that we are already extremely well-versed on. We don't need to tell these origin stories anymore. 
As far as comic book movies go, we don't need to see Thomas and Martha Wayne get shot in Crime Alley. We don't need to see Uncle Ben get killed. We don't need to see the Punisher's family get murdered in new and awful ways. What we need is for these characters to grow and evolve beyond what we already understand about them. Another thing that is largely missed from the first season of The Punisher is that nuanced dialogue that explores the morality and humanity of the character. The entire season sort of abandons these themes in favor of focusing on the action at hand. There's a significant lack of self-exploration that is absolutely necessary for the Punisher, and characters like the Punisher, to stand out. We need that juxtaposition. It's not like it isn't present throughout the first season, but it only comes in short bursts, and it only scratches the surface. Karen Page shows up from time to time to appeal to Frank Castle's humanity, and it's fun to watch the Punisher and Micro engage in these battles of mind over matter, but these moments feel largely forced and aren't nearly as deep or reflective as they were in Daredevil's second season. The Punisher is a character who screams for deep philosophical exploration, but in this first season, the focus seems to pivot more toward a structure of simply find and kill all of the guys, which at the end of the day is fine. After all, part of the fun in observing a character like the Punisher is watching the chaos and carnage that he causes, and the action scenes throughout the first season are actually quite impressive. John Bernthal's performance is full of subtleties and clearly came from an actor who treated the character with reverence every step of the way. We really feel like we're watching someone struggling with PTSD and their own concept of morality. But unfortunately, the discussion on those subjects starts and stops within the subtleties of that performance. They are never really extrapolated upon, and the entire first season trudges on without addressing them. It isn't bad, but when you watch it just after Daredevil's second season, it feels like something is missing. There was a massive course correction done in The Punisher's second season. It tells a much deeper and more personal story for Frank Castle, and in turn, hits on those themes of morality and justice a bit harder. Sure, Jigsaw looks more like his name could be paper cut, but he still serves as a solid foil to our protagonist while he deals with the rippling effects of his direct actions, like creating copycat killers and destabilizing criminal organizations. There are thousands of pages of amazing Punisher storylines written by scribes like Garth Ennis, who created The Boys and the Preacher, or Jason Aaron, who created gritty comic serials like Scalped and Southern Bastards, all of which push the character in completely new directions while exploring the minutiae of the inner workings of such a headstrong character. So why abandon all of these wild and new stories in favor of telling something that has been told over and over again since 1989 when Dolph Lundgren was at his peak? It seems like studios have a bit of a boogeyman they think is hiding in their closet, and if they don't tell an origin story, then the audience won't be able to follow along with the action. They think they're doing the right thing by delivering a story that they think everyone can understand, but they're wrong. We want our characters to move forward. We want to watch them grow in new environments. And while we do want these comic book characters to be challenged physically, what we really crave is for them to be challenged on a deeper moral and philosophical level. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with action and plot. Without the emotional and philosophical components though, our stories can feel like a tin man, strong and sturdy, but missing a lot of heart. That's it for today's episode. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. You might see a couple of links floating in the window here. Feel free to click on any of those if you want to stick around. And hey, thanks for watching Nerdstalgic.